Good morning. My name is Mike Quentin, pastor of Mesquite Baptist Church in Mesquite, Nevada. Thank you for joining us this morning. I don't know where you found us on our website, mesquitebaptistchurch.com, or on Facebook, of course, Mesquite Baptist Church on Facebook, or on YouTube. We And there's a link at the website for all the YouTube presentations that we've recorded over the last year or so since that uh, virus started. Uh, and we were able to enter this part of the ministry. So today we're going to take a look at the last commandment, John 13, 34 through 35. So if you could grab your Bibles. Uh, but in the meantime, I want you to know that people ask me if I'm optimistic and I say, well, I hope so. I hope that brought a smile to your face because laughter is good for the heart. But today we're going to talk about the heart. John 13, 34 through 35, the last commandment. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, please let this message be one of, of grace, one of honor, one of conviction, one that people will hear and obey, including myself. In Jesus' name, amen. So what in the world are, am I talking about here? John chapter 13 over in verses 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one another. How will others know that we have love for our brothers and sisters in Christ? believe that's what he's talking about here, our brethren. Well, let's take a look at some of the common examples that we like to use or we think people will recognize us by, and that is by our, especially in fundamental independent Baptist churches, by our rules. We have rules. Uh, a rules, according to the dictionary, is a prescribed guide for code of conduct, Okay. Uh, the Bible has the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is it our rules? Let's take a look at this in a few minutes. Let me list, go through the list first, okay? Is it our theology? Theology is the study of religious faith, our practice, our experience of religious faith. How about our righteousness? Righteousness is acting in accord with, with divine law or moral law, free from guilt or sin. Because our notice it's in accord with divine law or moral law, and to be a moral law has to have a divine lawgiver, because I could make a law that you would disagree with, and you could make a law that I would disagree with, because we come from a different background, and we have to go by divine moral laws because God is the ultimate lawgiver. So it's not our righteousness because our righteousness is self-righteous. We don't want that. And people, uh, you know, before I was saved, uh, like most people do still these days, they look at the church and they say, I'm not going down to that church. They're full of hypocrites. I said the same thing. And it was my own self-righteousness judging their self-righteousness. So it's not our righteousness. How about our power? We all seek control over our lives. And in the last 12 months, with the government uh, mandates and so forth, we've lost control over our lives. Con power is the control, the authority, or the influence over others. That can be a good thing. That can be used as a good thing. But unfortunately, with our human weaknesses, too often, you've heard this said, power corrupts. When you give people a little bit of power, all of a sudden, it goes to their head instead of their heart. And then it's been said, you give people absolute power, and they are corrupted absolutely, completely. So it's not power. How about rhetoric? What in the world is rhetoric? Rhetoric is skill in effective use of speech, a type or mode of speech. 
Yes, we are drawn to people's rhetoric. Uh, sometimes very evil, Adolf Hitler had a rhetoric that drew people to him. There are speakers that we love to hear. There are singers that we love to hear because of their command of the human language and speech. And if you're gonna go teach a Sunday school or, or, or whatever, you should have a good grasp of how to make a presentation so that people understand it and it's clear and it's meaningful. But it's not our rhetoric, folks. How about our purity? Our state of being pure, purity in conduct and its intention, free from moral fault. Uh, the Bible says that we're to not only not do evil, we're to keep away from evil and even the appearance of evil. It says to abstain from even the appearance of evil. So it means go the extra mile to distance yourself from evil so that no one would associate that with your conduct. How about our clubs, our associations, our groups? Every church has them. Choir, Awana, Vacation Bible School, uh, Patch the Pirate. They're all wonderful programs. But is that how people are going to know our love one for another? Uh, it goes to the extreme these days. Christian Zumba, uh, a run for hunger, you know, a three-mile run or something to raise money. There's nothing wrong with those. They have their place in society, and they are valuable. However, that's not how people are going to know our love one for another. Every day, we're faced with decisions, some minor, some life-changing. Yoga Berra, the famous baseball player, said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. It's ludicrous, but it's funny. You come to the fork in the road, you've got to take one or the other, not both, of course. So what do we base our decisions upon? Do you know the difference between a conviction and a preference? A conviction is based on the Word of God, a preference is I, uh, I prefer a certain color paint on the wall or the color of the carpet. That's a preference. But our convictions need to be based upon Bible principles, folks. 2 Timothy 3.14 through, uh, through 17 says that we are to, verse 14, we're to start studying young, the Bible. And in the very next verse, trust Christ as Savior, verse 15. Verse 16 all the scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, instruction in righteousness. Why? So that we, in verse 17, can com be completely, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All of these, all of these are good when used for the glory of God, including loving one another. Jesus had been teaching these people every day, the disciples, every day for three years. They'd been all together. He had been mentoring, explaining, setting the example. And over in Matthew 7, 28 and 29, they, it says they marveled. They marveled at how he spoke. They said he, had, he spoke with one, with authority, not as the scribes spoke. The scribes were a group of people who obviously scribed. They didn't have copy machines in those days, so they constantly copied the scriptures over and over. As the scriptures copies wore out, you needed to have replacements for them. So they should have been well-versed in that, in the Word of God, but they only spoke from what they read. Jesus is the Word of God. No wonder he spoke with such authority. So what did Jesus say the night he was betrayed by Judas. I read that to you to begin with, that I give you a new commandment, that you will love one another as I have loved you. It's pretty tall marching orders, folks. A new commandment, the very last one before the crucifixion. So how will the world, what will the world judge Jesus' followers by? Because he was about to leave them, and he's warning them, after I'm gone, Here's how they're going to judge you. By your rules, 
No. By your theology. No. By your righteousness. No. By your power over others. And like I said, power can be used for good. It rarely is, but it could be used for good. By our rhetoric, our presentation. No. By our purity. Did you know that God describes our righteousness as filthy rags? So no, it's not our purity. By our clubs. Clubs are wonderful. I mentioned Patch the Pirate for the little children in Awana. Those are wonderful clubs. But that's not how people are going to judge our relationship to our other brothers and sisters. How about their speaking abilities? Over in Acts 4.13, they said, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned, ignorant, let me add in, fishermen, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And they, they realized these guys were just fishermen a few days ago, a few three years ago, and now they're speaking boldly and eloquently in the power of God. Was it by the working of their miracles? They did miracles. Their boldness? No. Jesus said they will know you by your love one for another. Jesus laid the foundation of the most unique movement in all of human history. Christians would be identified by one characteristic, folks, and I judged them before I became one, and if you're not one today, you're probably doing the same thing, so it's, it's normal, it's natural, okay? Uh, I'm going to show you in a few minutes what's supernatural, that we will judge and be judged by one characteristic, and that is our love one for another. Is it the clothing we wear to church? Uh, we had some folks one time in California, as, as we got out of the car, we said, hey, why don't you join us in church? We we were dressed like this. They had on uh, walking shorts, and they, they said, oh, you guys dress up down there. It's not the clothes. It's not the clothes. In the Army, I wore a certain uniform. In the fire department, I wore a certain uniform. It's not the clothing that identifies us. You can Google every, and find every kind of organization and group in the world from radio-controlled airplanes to Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you name it. They all have a common interest, and they usually have a set of rules, maybe even a code of conduct that you have to obey to maintain that membership. But I'm telling you, church is unique. It's different from all of that. Believers in Christ will be known by their love for each other or not. I know we're not supposed to add to the scripture, but I, I wanted to throw that in there. We will also be known in the community by whether or, or not we have love for each other. Think of the 12 disciples that Jesus called. Uh, what a motley crew, right? Fishermen, tax collector, a zealot, a doubter, others. Some of them were already friends. Some were relatives. Some were complete strangers, and yet... Here's these 12 people, rough, sinful, like us, selfish, like us. And in those three years, they, were, they witnessed the love of God himself. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus repeatedly, repeatedly prefaced his teachings with, you've heard it said, and then he would give an example, but I say, over Matthew 5, 21 through 28, he gives several examples of that. Let's take a look at that one because that one's pretty important. They're all important, but more applicable to what we're talking about here. 21 through 28, he talks and he says, You've heard it said by them of old time, you shall not kill. And he says, I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother, it's the same as killing someone. And he says, on further, if you uh, commit uh, lust in your heart for another person, you've committed adultery, the same as the physical adultery. So those are examples of, he says, you've heard it said, but I say, 
When Jesus proclaimed this new commandment at the Last Supper, it fit perfectly with what he had been teaching and practicing for three years, for three whole years, Jesus had shown them that love is not dependent on the worthiness of the one being loved. God's love embraces all our flaws, all our faults, all our weaknesses. Jesus demonstrated unconditional love by washing the feet of those who would betray him. Over in John chapter 13, 14 through 15, and 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, it shows us this unconditional love. And I said, by those who would betray him. He said, oh, but only Judas betrayed him. Remember, Peter betrayed him also. So, yes. So what does it mean to love one another? 1 John 4, 21 and this commandment we have from Jesus that he who loves God also loves his brother. The first church demonstrated this. Over in Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it describes all the different nationalities that had gathered that day in Jerusalem, a multitude of people, okay? 3,000 people out of the thousands who heard G Peter preach that day trusted Christ as Savior. And then they began to meet together and share their earthly goods, their food, their uh, whatever, their blanket, their shoes, their sandals, whatever. Acts 2, 44 through 46 is love in action. Acts 2, 47. As a result of this, these people getting saved and sharing and showing their love one for another, Acts 2.47 says that they found the church, the new church, found favor with all those different people in Jerusalem that day. So how does Jesus love? Romans 5.8 says, For God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. So it's unconditional love. While we were yet sinners, he didn't say straighten your life out, then I'll love you. He said, I love you now, sinner. And he died for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that Jesus knew no sin, yet was made sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he was made sin for us. Our sins were put upon him on the cross. It is an unconditional love. It is a sacrificial love. Ephesians 4, 32. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you and I. So it's a forgiving love. Romans 8, 38 through 39 describes all the things of this world, past, present, future, that we believe could separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, 38 through 39, I challenge you to get in there and read that after we're done with this presentation today because it'll lead you to the same conclusion I have. It's not only a unconditional love, a sacrificial love, a forgiving love, it's an eternal love. And culminates in this, 1 John 4, 9 through 10. Let's take a look over there, just in front of Revelation. 1 John, 1 John, 1 John. There we go. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the substitution, the propitiation for our sins. I didn't love God and seek him out. He loved me and sought me out. We are to love one another just like that. How can we do that? We're natural. That sounds supernatural to me. You're right, it is. 
1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says that you and I as believers have the Holy Spirit of God, part of the Trinity, residing in us. If you and I will yield to the Holy Spirit in us and obey the Holy Spirit in us, we will demonstrate this unconditional, sacrificial, forgiving love to fellow believers in Christ. You said, that's pretty, pretty uh, tough marching orders. You don't know the people I go to church with. Uh, you don't know the people that uh, come to the men's prayer breakfast. You don't know, you don't know. Yes, I do know, because I'm one of them. And it's hard for people to love me at times. Most of the time, probably. Even though I'm a brother in Christ. So if we will just allow the Holy Spirit to control us and obey, then we will supernaturally be able to demonstrate this sacrificial, forgiving love to fellow believers. Okay, that's tough. But now it gets tougher. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Let's turn over there again. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That sounds like a pretty good deal, huh? Because that's what most of us do, including me, including yours truly. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Oh my goodness. I thought it was going to be tough to love my brothers, Christian brothers and sisters, and for them to love me as, as commanded here by God. And now he's gone even further and says we're supposed to love our enemies, pray for them that despitefully use us. You see, love generated by the flesh is selfish. It's egotistical. It's unforgiving. It's insincere. But 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, describes what a believer with the Holy Spirit of God can express as the true love that Jesus is describing here. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And once I start reading this, you'll be familiar with it. It says, charity, that is love, suffers long. Charity, love, is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not puff itself up. Love does not behave itself unseemingly. It thinks no evil. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, in sin, in injustice, but it rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. We do not naturally love with a 1 Corinthians chapter 13 type of love. Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, immediately you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And that Holy Spirit, Romans 5.5 5 says, is shed in our hearts, which is given to us by God. It says the love of God is in our hearts. Therefore, it's a supernatural thing that we can do if we allow the Holy Spirit to rule in our lives. We all have 100% capacity. If I've got allowing 1% of me to be controlled by the Holy Spirit and 99% of me to be controlled by me, I'm not going to demonstrate that. We've got to get it the other way around, folks. I don't believe there's ever been anyone ever lived in human nature that gave 100%, but that's what we need to strive for each and every day, that the Holy Spirit would rule our tongues, rule our hearts, rule our eyes, rule our hands, every single day. John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give you, 
love one another as I loved you. And by this, by this love, all will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. Let me add, he also said to love your enemies and those who despitefully use you. Father, Lord, as you know, it's been an especially tough week for me. I had prepared this message already before this week began, and then this week challenged me with all of these thoughts here that you have commanded us to do and obey. Lord, I pray that this message today was as convicting of the listeners as it was of me and that you would help me to follow through with these commandments that you have given. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of the listeners will be able to apply it in their lives, including me, in your name, in your precious son's name, in your honor and your glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, maybe you're out there today and you go, I have no idea what you've been talking about because I am not a Christian. Maybe you thought you were a Christian before the broadcast began, but let me expand that just a little bit for you, okay? Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Before you say, I'm not a sinner, August 15th, 1976, I didn't acknowledge myself as a sinner either, even though in my heart I knew I had lied, I had done other things I was ashamed of, and, and God pointed those out to me in my heart. The Holy Spirit convicted me and said, yes, you are, Mike. You are a sinner. You need a Savior, someone to pay the price God demands of sinners. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Okay, we're all going to die. That's not the end of it. People will tell you that death is the end, that we just die like a, an animal, and that there's no soul which is going to live forever. The Bible makes it clear, quite clear, that you and I have a soul that after death it's going to exist forever in one of two places heaven with Jesus, or hell without God. The decision for one or the other has to be made now in this life. August 15th, 1976, I acknowledged I saw myself as a sinner before God Almighty, not before my fellow men. They were no worse than me and I was no worse than them. But compared to God, yes, I was and am a sinner. I trusted Christ as Savior and instantly I'm guaranteed everlasting life through that faith in him. John 3.16 says, God the Father gave his only begotten Son. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, that whosoever believes in Jesus should not perish but have ever lasting life. So I have that everlasting life. Am I perfect? No. There's a process after salvation where we try to study and learn and with the Holy Spirit's power, obey God's marching orders and commandments. It's not suggestions, it's commandments. And so if you have not trusted Christ as Savior, None of us are guaranteed another breath, another day. I beg you, don't put it off another day. If the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart right now and you're saying, you know, what he's saying is true. It's not what I'm saying, it's what the Bible's saying is true. You, you recognize you're a sinner in need of a Savior. I ask you today to humbly bow your head and your heart and do what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves. That's a gift of God, not of works. Nothing we can do to work our way to heaven, lest anyone should boast. So I challenge you today, don't put it off. Don't let another day, another breath go by without trusting Christ as Savior. 
And you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on the web at mesquitebaptistchurch.com. And up there on the dashboard, of course, is a button you can push to go to all these YouTube presentations, to go to our Facebook page. I won't share it. I won't sell your information with anyone if you contact us. I would just love to hear from you that somehow this presentation of God's word made its way into your heart today and that you trusted Christ as Savior. Nothing would make me happier than to hear that. So please, until then, God be with you.